What's up with those alien bodies presented to the Mexican Congress? With scientists putting on display what they claim are the remains of two extraterrestrials. This in Mexico put on display what they claim are two alien corpses, but not everybody's convinced. (laughs) So officially, these alien bodies presented in Mexican Congress were found in Peru in the Nazca Plains of Peru. This is a famous area where there are patterns drawn in the ground, where if you're down on the ground, you you can't, so they're just markings in the thing. You have to get high above before you see that there are huge diagrams that are there. Some are straight lines and some very inventive and imaginative people imagine those as runways for ancient aliens. Plains, the Nazca, Plains have been uh, a hotbed of speculation for visiting aliens of distant past. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so the, these alien bodies presented to Mexican Congress are described as having been found in that region of Peru. By the way, just a few days ago, I received an official invitation to Mexico to look at these two alien bodies personally. An official invitation. And I declined for a very simple reason. I, I, but I'd love to see the aliens. But if you're going to make an official invitation to a scientist, that invitation should not go to an astrophysicist. It needs to go to a biologist. In fact, it needs to go to 10 biologists, biochemists. Invite them, 10 of them, five of them, any more than three, okay? They all come and they each take home a sample of the bodies, of the alien bodies. That's how you do this, because that's how science works. Science works not by one person declaring one result from their one experiment. No, not even from their two experiments. Objective truths are established when a person brings forth a result, those results are shared. It could be data, it could be tissue samples, it could be whatever. There's sh- or explicit instructions on how to reproduce what you did. They're shared with other laboratories, regionally and around the world. When you get agreement in the results, then you have established a new objective truth. That's why I've said that the, the bumper sticker version of that is, the good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. By the way, it's also true whether or not you swore to tell the truth about it, right? Scientific truths are not established by you swearing that what you're saying is true. Nothing could be less relevant to establishing us. You know what else is not relevant? What your pedigree is. I don't care how many stars and bars are on your epaulets. That doesn't matter. What matters is your experiment. Do you realize in my field, Published research papers have the names of the authors, almost all of them are collaborations today, the names of all the authors, and your degree is not included next to your name. So that PhDs, master's level people, undergraduates, high school students, people who are senior heads of laboratories, on a research paper, you're all equal. Because if you, it, it's a tacit recognition that if you have a great idea, that idea can come from anybody at any time. And I was not among them, but I, I have fellow undergraduates who did real good research on a summer project, got their name on a research paper. Your title and your academic pedigree is irrelevant when establishing what is objectively true in the world. If those two alien mummies are real, Its reality is not established by the sworn testimony of who presented them, nor is it established by anything he says about them. It's established by sharing your data with other laboratories, especially skeptical other laboratories. Okay, to my knowledge, that hasn't happened yet. So we have an authentic level of skepticism. Oh, by the way, 
the rules I'm describing here, we follow these rules for less than aliens, okay? That we, we have re obscure scientific results that you don't care about, the press will never write about, yet they're still held to the standards that I'm describing. So you know, if you're pulling out aliens out of your, out of your closet, that the rules that we apply to any other scientific claim you're making, they're definitely gonna be applied to these. And to, to quote Carl Sagan, an extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. The claim is that what is there are aliens not of this earth. So we better have extraordinary evidence for it. So what you want to do is create, get tissue. If they're mummified, there's still tissue samples there. All right. If it's if it was once living tissue, they're clearly dead now. Take tissues. All right. You can afford to do this. The, the aliens they're not very big. They're like three feet tall, something like that, in their in their little transparent coffins. But take tissue, send it out to labs all around. Do that. Let other people who you don't even know, but have established laboratory practices. Test that tissue, okay? That's what you should do. If that comes through and we get verification, now we're talking. And they're aliens not because you swore they were aliens, they're aliens because the scientific method established that fact. And what is the scientific method? I'll tell you. Uh, do whatever it takes to not fool yourself into thinking something is true that is not, or to thinking something is not true that is. Whatever it takes, that is the scientific method, period. If it means getting chart recorders, if it means not using your susceptible mental state to establish the reality, get other witnesses, but ideally make get machines to make the measurement, because machines don't care whether they had coffee this morning, whether they were awake, they don't get sleepy on the job, they, the machines, and then get another machine made by somebody else to make the measurement. Yeah, because maybe your machine is faulty. Maybe the wall current you plugged it into had a glitch. This is what you, so that you're not fooled. That's the only thing the scientific method requires of us. So I was delighted to see the two alien buddies come out. Now, I have other issues, which I'm happy to share with you, but I'm done speaking about this in terms of the scientific method. If this is life from another planet, they look awfully human. Oh my gosh. So early Hollywood aliens, they would, you know, give them like three eyes or, you know, antennas, but it was still an actor in a costume walking, you know, and they have head, shoulders, arms, legs, fingers, hips, thighs, legs, and feet, calves and feet. So, Occasionally, an alien was more creative than that. Keeping in mind, if it comes from another planet, it got, it's got to look at least as different from humans as any two other life forms on Earth look from each other. Is that asking too much? All right, so one of my favorite aliens was the Blob. 1950, I think it was remade later, but in 1958, Steve McQueen, one of his early movie roles, the Blob was, it fell from space on it like a meteorite. It was a Blob. The movie was aptly named. It was a blob and it started out with no color. It was transparent. And then it like attacked you. And after it consumed its first victim, the blob was red for the rest of the movie. You might forget it started out with no color. There's nothing on earth like that. Good alien, really, really good alien. Okay, how about alien versus, uh, how about uh, the movie Predator? That was an alien, but wait a minute. That alien was approximately human size. It had eyes, a mouth, arms. It used shoulder-mounted weapons. It had knees. It's an actor in a costume. Oh, you give it a weird face. Okay. All right. Surely you can do better than that if he comes from another planet. Do you realize we have DNA in common with a banana? And we look really different from a banana. So if you're going to bring an alien from another planet, Make it look more different from humans and a banana than humans and a banana look from each other. That's all I'm asking of you. So these Mexican aliens, okay, 
They had a head, shoulders, arms, legs, legs hips, uh, femurs. The, they had hands. Oh, they had three fingers instead of five. Okay. All right. And another curious fact, they're so humanoid with their, they had two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. But wait a minute. If you're mummified and you want to be that human, there is no bone structure underneath your nose. Look at any skull. Look at any mummified thing. It's it, There's a gap there. Yet these aliens had these two little tiny little pointy noses. So, all right, so maybe these aliens have a bone nose. Nose bone, okay? I, I guess. So, to the extent that it was just fakery, what betrays the fakery is how human they look. Let me just put it that way. If you're going to fake an alien and make it convincing, do better than that. Oh, one last thing. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Alien comes and says, take me to your leader. Don't take him to any leaders. No, don't do that. Don't go to the White Bring him to me. All right. No, but take him to the National Academy of Sciences. This is what you do to people who will know how to think about who it is that just asked that question. Or better yet, take the alien to Comic-Con. They'll feel right at home as they look at all the other aliens. <laughs> that way, when they go back home, they'll say, you know, those humans, they're just like us. That's a, a view from above, a cosmic perspective on the Mexican aliens. As always, keep looking up, especially for the aliens. Yeah.